Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the work of the Young Invincibles, an organization dedicated to amplifying the voices of young people in the political process with our special guest, Kristen McGuire, Executive Director of the Young Invincibles. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. So I found this organization so interesting and an organization after our own heart because we are about civil society and not about political parties, not about party politics. It's really about helping people to live better lives, happier lives, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it seems that as as I look at how you are constructed and your board members who have served uh, causes and leaders in red states and blue states from all sorts of political uh, elements, you also are about the civil society aspects that affect young people. So you were founded 15 years ago. Talk a little bit about your founding and your uh, your sensibility surrounding these uh, these issues. Sure. So uh, we're excited to be here today. Um, and I think it's important when we think about how Young Invincibles was founded. Um, and this is, is a great time to begin to reflect because next year we celebrate our 15 year anniversary. Um, So we were founded by a group of college students in the heat of the ACA uh, Obamacare healthcare debate. Um, And really what it came down to is should young people have access to health insurance under this new exchange that was coming out? Um, And insurance companies began to call this group of young people under 35 years old, young and invincible uh, and that we didn't access health care because we felt we were invincible. Uh, and, and what that led to was our founders saying, well, actually, um, young people have health issues as well. And we do have a dire need for uh, access to health care. Uh, and that's how Young Invincibles was born. Uh, we are, you are correct, we are a nonpartisan young, uh, young adult organization. And we're really looking at the intersection of healthcare, uh, plus expanded issue areas of higher education, workforce and finance, and civic engagement, and and how those issues work together and interplay to uh, help create uh, fulfilled lives for young people. Uh, what I what I say very often is we like to explore what it takes uh, to build uh, the American dream for this generation. How do you deal with the fact that in today's politics, people are characterizing others and then uh, putting them into uh, pigeonholes or branding them or creating an identity for them that they might not be creating for themselves. So that if you, for example, are interested in healthcare coverage, you could be um, branded as being partisan just because you're interested in healthcare coverage, right? If you're interested in a particular Um, issue with education and funding education, which is the interest of young people who are trying to get educated, you could be branded as being partisan simply because you have that particular interest. Um, How do you deal with that idea of being branded by somebody else who is not one of the Young Invincibles, not one of your members, but then you get branded and then sidelined, right? The the attempt is, is to create sort of a, well, you're with them, not with us, but that really takes away voice. How do you, how do you manage that? Sure. So as I stated before, we're, we're heading into our 15th year. So we have uh, lived through uh, different uh, administrations, right? And really what we try to, to, to nail drill in on is that these are American issues and uh, ensuring that we can shore up uh, the the basic foundation for young people is actually helping shoring up our country. If young people are healthy, we will have adults who will be healthy and have access to care. When we ensure that young people are well educated or trained for the next career, we're, we are then solidifying our own nation's economy. So it's not partisan. It's really future proofing our country, if you will. We need to ensure that our next generation of leaders have access uh, to basic human rights like health and wellness, uh, making sure they have food if they're in college, making sure that they're able to afford higher education, making sure they understand 
how and when to vote. Uh, and we can do those things without a partisan lens. We can do these should be uh, issues that are bipartisan and in fact are. Uh, we work with um, elected officials from all political parties uh, as long as they care about advancing uh, the agenda of young adults and and really our nation. So let's talk a little bit about that, that issue that you mentioned, the whole issue of, of the right to vote and access to the vote. And in particular, one of the things that we're seeing is, is some um, intent to reduce uh, turnout among young folks in areas where there is a concentration of, of college students, right? Because they uh, the, the idea there is that it will tilt that particular um, region in a particular way um, how do you deal with that kind of, of situation where you don't get drawn into this whole uh, culture war, but you are also defending your rights as American voters? Absolutely. Uh, young voters of today are our standard voters of tomorrow. And what we need to do is ensure that we are creating and curating that culture of civic engagement and voting uh, from as early as possible. Uh, some states, you can pre-register to vote at 16, so you're ready to vote at 18. In other states, you know, just ensuring that people know when the elections are as, as soon as they are 18. What we know is that young people have been voting and breaking records in, in every year since 2020. We have uh, showed up to the polls in record numbers. And I think that's significant because if we have a representative democracy, then we should want uh, people voting for who represents them. Uh, that's not partisan. That is how our country was built. So I think as we continue uh, to have more young people being the most diverse generation that our nation has ever seen, we can expect that our representatives will reflect that. And we shouldn't create barriers for young people to vote to stop that. We should, uh, we should uphold it. We should embrace it uh, because that is why our democracy was founded. Uh, that, that's how it was founded. And we should continue to allow that to flourish. So we've been talking about things that are not particularly controversial in the eyes of young people. In other words, access to health care that is affordable, the right to vote. But there are also other issues that are that are far more fraught. So if you look at young people, there are people across the spectrum when it comes to things like uh, women's re reproductive health and the right to abortions. How do you deal with those kinds of situations where people might have different perspectives do you uh, basically not make that part of your advocacy or do you provide balance advocacy? Do you take a particular side? How does that work? Sure. So actually, young people are involved in every step of our process through uh, we have a national survey of young adults. Uh, we have national and state advisory boards of young adults. And we also have a leadership development program uh, called the Young Advocates Program. Uh, and also our staff is a majority of people under 35. So we really are in tune with young adult voice. And again, we do not consider uh, reproductive rights to be a partisan issue. Uh, it is health care. And so as we continue to advocate for health care to be expanded, reproductive rights are included in our, our health care advocacy. And in terms of things like the deficits, I mean, one of the things that I'm that, that I'm really um, more sensitive about is that as I was going through my various stages in my 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on, I basically created the world along with my fellows that we have today, right? And our parents created this world. The world has got some, some real issues. The United States has some real issues where we have uh, huge deficits. Um, uh, we're not necessarily funding them through our tax structure. We have uh, global warming. There are other issues, wars, conflicts, and so on. And the thing that 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 I'm, I'm really becoming much more sensitive to is that there's a generational tension in which the problems that I'm leaving behind are, are being foisted upon yourself and the young invincibles. How do people see this? Are, are, are you all angry at, at, at those people who are... Uh, which I guess would be justifiable, or or how do you how do you um, encounter 
the the preceding generations who have left you with some real challenges to deal with? Sure. So I think that is uh, the big moral question in our country. Every generation should be leaving uh, our country and our, our planet in a little bit better shape than, than how we found it. That's my personal mantra. I would like to leave things a little better. Uh, and what we see here is, um, you know, through laws that want to prevent people from accessing health care or being able to vote, that it almost seems like the clock is being rolled backwards in a sense. Uh, so I wouldn't say it, it's anger. It, it is more confusion um, as to why we aren't all on the same page and why why do we have a country where we can't see uh, why it's important to center young people in policies because young people will be the ones primarily impacted as adults. Well, plastics in our food, right? I mean, plastics in our food are there because of me, right? It's yeah, because yeah. Of, the, of the fact that, that I blithely bought plastic stuff that was sold to me by people like me, and I ate it. I ate the food that it was right. And then I threw the plastic away. Well, the plastic ends up going back to our food chain. And then nowadays I'm eating that plastic and you'll be eating that plastic in our fish and in various other, I mean, and, and the the various pollutants, these, these uh, micro substances that have gotten into our food chain. Right. Our bodies, right. Right. So how do we, how do we create the changes in the behaviors using the energy that the young invincibles uh, have and the ideas that they have, and maybe the consciousness that you can raise in people like myself so that I start behaving. Sure. How does that work? So there's this, there's this uh, thing, I kind of call it like intergenerational approaches to policy, right? And so at Young Invincibles, one thing we're really great at is when we are able to educate and train young people on these issues, what we know is that very often they go back and talk to their parents, their grandparents, and we start to have these conversations. So even if you think about an issue that might, might be as simple as healthcare, we're now able to have young people be those those spokespeople to kind of talk about why healthcare is important generationally and why why young people need to have access to expanded care. Um, and so what I think will begin to happen, what has begun to happen actually, is that we're kind of shifting these long held American narratives about what it means to be young, uh, what kind of responsibilities young people have. Um, an example that I think that you will most likely be able to to identify with is that of the starving student, right? And how it was almost a badge of honor to go to college and, and not be able to afford food. Um, and it was that way when I was in college that, you know, it was just expected that you lived on ramen noodles and, you know. Well, that's how I learned to cook. I would go to the uh, to the local Safeway. I'd get the very sorry looking vegetables that were on in the sale bins and, and you know, the meat that was expired and all that other right. stuff. And I learned how to cook because, I couldn't afford anything else. So I made stews right. and soups. And, and that's been an American principle that's that's held very strong in our country since people have been paying to go to college. Uh, and what we've been able to do in the past 10, 15 years is kind of switch that narrative that actually college students shouldn't have to be food insecure to receive a college education. And so what you'll see across the country now is that college students are now um, eligible for SNAP benefits. And the government does help them get food uh, if they're enrolled in college as a student. And that is a very shift change, a sharp change from what we've seen a decade ago. So those types of intergenerational approaches to policy where we're able to identify an issue and then talk from a, a viewpoint that you understand, that I understand, and generations today understand and really start to think like, maybe it is weird to think that college students can't eat because they're in school. Uh, and then actually be able to talk to legislators and get them to shift the laws and get states to even uh, join in and shift the laws as well to even provide access to um, EBT on college dining facilities. And so that's the kind of work that we do where we kind of work to amplify the voices of young adults, help them share their stories across media and really begin to drill down and shift those mindsets that we've held so close as, as Americans in our American culture. Um, and, and that's the work that we do. And we do that across all of our issues, really just changing the definition of, of what it means to be young in America right now. 
Now, you know, what you're what you're saying is so interesting because if you take a look at one of the challenges that America has is that of having an educated workforce. So if we make getting an education a little bit more easier, right? It's just like anything else, right? You make it a little bit easier, you make it a little bit cheaper, then more people can actually get an education, right? Or if you make, I don't know, buying a bicycle a little bit cheaper, more people can buy bicycles, right? It's 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 simple market dynamics. Now, if we have more educated young people, we have more people we can hire, mm-hmm. right? And all of a sudden you end up releasing all this creativity that is locked away in people's minds because they haven't had any uh, education to access it and to express it in a way that is commercially uh, and economically useful to themselves. And all of a sudden you end up with fewer people who need help, right? So what you're doing is you're making an investment in young people in a way that is actually an investment in the co- in the country. But what you're saying is that I might not actually be aware of this if I'm deprived of the voice of young people to advocate for themselves. So talk yes. a little bit about the various um, advocacy issues that you think are the uh, are, uh, are at the top of your list. Is it still healthcare and, and those kinds of issues or have these evolved over the last 15 years? Uh, so we've definitely evolved over the past 15 years, but healthcare is still one of our top priorities. We still have states in our country where folks don't have access to affordable health care. Uh, and, and that's not OK, uh, because before we can work on anything, we need to ensure that we have a healthy citizenry. Uh, we can't talk about higher education if we don't have healthy people who are ready to embark on a higher education journey. Uh, so from from uh, health care, we now work on higher education, like I mentioned, workforce and finances and civic engagement. So in our healthcare space, we're absolutely looking at uh, expanding it in the states that <clears throat> that need to be expanded. Uh, and we're also looking at like uh, the addition of mental health care supports Um now more than than ever, we really need to focus on um, our, the mental health care of our country, especially our young adults. Post pandemic, uh, anxiety is at an all time high, and we need to ensure that we have supports in place to kind of again help young people. These are our next leaders, and we need to make sure that that you know they have everything that they need. Um, and we're looking at this uh, as an intersection within higher education as well, uh, because we know many young people can be served in the institutions of higher education. So ensuring that uh, the, that there are basic needs provided there, that students are uh, able to eat, that they have shelter, uh, and also that they have the health care supports and inclusive of mental health care. Um, In our workforce, we're really looking at, you brought up um, our tax base, looking at, you know, our our tax codes, uh, earned income tax credit, child tax credits, uh, and how they impact young people. That's Um, interesting. So so you're looking at the tax code? That's really interesting. Uh, absolutely. So Young Invincibles, you know, we're we're policy research and advocacy. So uh, we have really smart, wonky people who uh, are checking things out, like why aren't young people eligible for earned income tax credits uh, and what kind of advocacy needs to happen there? Uh, so we actually just released a paper earlier this year. Um, I want I think it was last month, actually, on uh, earned income tax credit and young adults. Um, as um, like a a follow-up to our financial health of young America, Mm -hmm. where we look at uh, the finances of young people. This is our second time. We did it in 2017 um, and really look at this generation today and compare it to generations before us. And what we're finding out is we're actually uh, declining. We have uh, negative wealth as opposed to generations before us, uh, where there was a time at 25 where you could be ready to start your family and purchase a home. That is not a reality for 25 year olds today. So it, th- that's a really interesting uh, question. It, is, is it true that, that proportionately young people pay a larger proportion of their income. I'm talking about people who are earning, who are self-sufficient now. Right. Are they paying a larger proportion of their income into taxes than other age groups? You know, I would have to check on that, but I would say off the top of my head, there are more young people now. So young people as a whole 
are paying more into a system because there are just simply more young people. Um, on an individual basis, I would definitely have to have our, our workforce policy uh, manager come give us all of the numbers. But I know that we do uh, we do add a lot into our tax base to not be eligible for some of the cuts uh, that older people are. And it's just because of age. It's really it's really intriguing, because if what's going on right now with an with a, a, on average, an aging population, right, an aging population, the older uh, 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 population cohorts are absorbing more resources because they're no longer earning an income. Right. They're they're on. Uh, pensions, they're in retirement, they're not capable of working, they need a lot of care, there's a lot of health care that's, that's required. I'm wondering whether what's, what is going on right now is we need to rebalance so that the, uh, the middle of that age cohort has to bear more of the responsibility uh, proportionately in preparation for their own uh, aging uh, aging out, because we're not going to end up having a situation where the young people can can bear all these different costs. It's it becomes a financial issue for and a prosperity issue, as you say. If 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 that energy is being dissipated into into too much investment to make up for the failings of previous generations, um, we're going to end up with a problem in this country because young people should be able to invest in themselves, not sustain you know, their older relatives uh, for most of their lives. You know, it's it really. And, I, and, and that's the plight of uh, a lot of young adults, while the the common myth or, or misconception is that, you know, young people aren't moved. I'm sure you've heard they don't move out of their parents' homes. And um, but but the true answer is that young people cannot move out if they are privileged enough to have a family where they can still reside in that home. It's because they can't. We have a housing shortage and affordability crisis. The wages aren't keeping up. Um, so, uh, you know, the world is different. Um, I can remember uh, my grandfather. Uh, he worked at a sawmill in Alabama and he used to tell my brothers and I, you know, just just get a good factory job or get a good government job. Go get go get a job at the post office, um, not knowing that as I entered adulthood, it was a very real notion that we were going to lose our postal system and there, there, there was no post office. Right. So that economy, that America does not exist, that that factory get the government job that doesn't exist for us. And that's why it's important to, to invest in what we do have, the economy that we do have, which is why higher education and apprenticeships are so important, because we have to have these specialized investments to ensure that we are preparing our future workforce for all of those reasons you mentioned, um, just to keep up with uh, our country's economy uh, so that people can move out. Uh, young people are delaying milestones that other generations before us have not had to delay. Uh, the age of marriage is increasing. Um, you know, people are delaying starting families. Home ownership, uh, the, the rate of purchasing your first home is increasing, which then also means that the likelihood of purchasing a second home or income property or anything like that uh, drastically declines uh, the later you, you purchase your first home. So I think these are all issues that we look at uh, when we look at the, the financial health of young people um, and, and looking for policy-based solutions to those issues. So if you were to um, give advice across generations to my generation, right, to the preceding generation to mine, so the 40-somethings, the 40-somethings, the 60-somethings, and the 80-somethings, okay, what do we need to do to help you inform everyone across the generations, right? Young people, people in the mid, in mid career, people who are very senior in their career and people who are retired. How, how do we need to change? How do I need to change, Kristen? Well, I would say first and foremost, I think what we need to focus on is that we're all in this together. Um, and and that all of these issues impact us in different ways. Is it a matter of respect of me 
respecting I think you. Absolutely. And, and getting out of your own head. I think if we hear when I was young, like if a sentence begins to start with that, we're already in, in the wrong direction because the world is not the same. And I think if we can really just get down to that, that basic understanding of, of course, you didn't have skyrocketing student debt because the system was built in a way where you could go to college and, and work part time and just pay cash for your tuition. That is no longer the case. That is actually very well, I had skyrocketing debt and so did my wife. It took us um, it, and, and really uh, seriously, it took us, I think, 15 years uh, each to. Uh, and and even that that that's terrible, number one. But now it takes longer than 15 years to to pay off, pay off your debt. So I think what we need to kind of think about is that the world is just not the same. Uh, personal finances are not the same um, and the ability to kind of create wealth and a fulfilled life for yourself uh, that that dream for economic opportunity is just not the same. And if we can if we can hone in on that and move forward from there, we can create a system where we understand like we we're paying for Social Security now for folks who will need to utilize it, you know, years before us. But but what we expect is those those same kinds of concessions. So while some older people may no longer have student debt, understanding that having having, you know, almost two trillion dollars in student debt across the country, that's two trillion dollars that we're not able to put in other places like for our own retirements. Right. And once we start to think about the interconnectedness of us as a people and how these policy areas interact with us as different age groups, I think we can really move forward in a way that's best for our country. And, you know, young people aren't anti anything. We want our country to work just as great for us as it did for, for previous generations. And, and that's really what Young Invincibles is getting at, that we deserve the right to have access to economic opportunity. And we have the right to be able to vote in a way that makes sense for us without barriers and understanding that the, that has a different meaning because the world is different now and, you know, and things change and that's OK. And, and when we become the older adults, guess what? There's going to be some young invincibles that are telling us, well, you know, that doesn't work great for us and we need you to be a little more flexible. And at that point, we'll have to listen. You know, um, Reverend Cecil Williams talked to me about mutuality. Mm -hmm. Right. And the whole idea is that this idea that that the powerful doesn't have to listen to people who are less powerful because they they finally achieved through age or through accomplishment or whatever, a position of power that is known as hubris. Right. As soon as you stop listening and you have confidence in your own truth so that you overshadow somebody else's truth, it's hubris and you make mistakes. And what you're saying is. You've got to just listen to each other. Absolutely. You've got to make room. And you're you're making room, a little wedging yourself into this dialogue and making sure that those issues are being represented. Kristen McGuire, executive director of the Young Invincibles, thank you so yeah. much for sharing the work that you do. Please thank yeah. your people, your staff, your volunteers, your funders, absolutely, your board members. This has just been a great conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I've been informed by it. And hopefully. I've been changed by it. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.